Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation you have a question, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we will try to get to as many as questions as we can near the end of today's webinar. And also at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is how AI is revolutionizing software test automation. Our speaker today is Aaron Bakar, who is a senior product manager, functional test at Microfocus. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, great. Well, I know that, th so I'm really excited about this webinar and this is a great topic and it's it's certainly very timely, especially since you guys had a uh, an announcement yesterday about AI, empower, AI powered enhancements to uh, your UFT family of uh, automated uh, uh, functional testing. So why don't you tell us, maybe we could start out, you could tell us a little bit about that and um, then uh, then we can kind of dive right into the webinar. Yeah, so actually yesterday Microfocus announced uh, the availability of uh, infused AI capabilities into our functional testing offering. Uh, and with that new and exciting capabilities that we are going to touch base on those today and also have um, a demo. Uh, we are going to, as you said, revolutionize the test automation space and we are going to help our customers uh, with the challenges that they are facing almost on a daily basis with uh, one of the most important critical tasks around test automation and continuous testing. Nice, nice. All right. Well, going to be some good stuff for sure, but uh, why don't we go ahead and kick things off with a poll? What do you think? Yep, let's start with it. All right, great. Well, there's a poll coming out to you right now, um, just to kind of get an idea of the challenges that are that folks are facing these days with automated testing. So, uh, the poll should be up on your screen. The question is, what is your greatest challenge with automated testing? The pace of change is too fast. Tests keep breaking. Can't run tests quickly enough. Lack of test coverage or lack of quality. Go ahead and make your submission, please, and we'll give you guys a couple more seconds, and then we'll go ahead and uh, close the poll, take a look at the results, and then Aaron, you go ahead and uh, get going with your presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. While we are waiting for everybody to go ahead and make your submission, uh, just a, a real quick reminder that anytime during the webinar today, if you have a question for Aaron, you don't have to wait until the question and answer period. You can use uh, the GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question at any time. All right, let's go ahead and close out the poll and see what the results are. Um, Aaron, it looks like the majority of folks um, are uh, really um, most challenged by the pace of change, that it's too fast for them, which is kind of interesting, um, especially, uh, you know, if, if you think about, uh, you know, the, just the number of applications that are going out on a, on a daily basis and the iterations um, and the importance of testing uh, within you know the, the DevOps process so you know do you do, does these do these um, answers kind of jive with what you're seeing and hearing in the marketplace Definitely, definitely. Uh, those answers and the rates that we see uh, on all five questions are pretty much fit to what we see with our users and customer base. And uh, mm -hmm. it's good to, to have you guys on the line today because I do believe that most of uh, those uh, things which are uh, your main challenges are going to be discussed today and we are going to uh, show you how we can help you uh, solve those challenges. 
Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm going to go ahead and hide the poll results and your slide is back up. So um, at, this, at this point, I'll go ahead and put myself on mute and let you get right into your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Charlene. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this webinar. I'd like to start this session by thanking you with me first through the journey testing has gone through in the, in the last few decades. So let's let's go back in time quickly to the early 80s, where you know there was no real need to scale testing beyond manual. We saw that user experience was not really exist. It was mainly about uh, client server kind of interaction, and even if we had a UI, those were a basic UI stuff, and we had a very limited variety of endpoints where we need to interact with. Which again, the manual testing was good enough solution for now because the number of tests that needs to be validated was like tens to uh, um, hundreds. In the early 90s, what we saw is uh, the increased desktop ecosystem and the emerging web, mainly because of the introduction of the Windows operating system uh, and uh, this uh, new browser thing that came to our space. And uh, that created the initial need to have a lightweight automation tools because we had a need to verify the, those desktop native applications and the first browser solutions. And hundreds of tests was uh, the need in order to validate something and certify before releasing to production. So the bottom line was that limited automation was just fine uh, back then in the uh, 90s. In the first decade of this century, web is the king. We saw on top of Internet Explorer, we saw other browsers coming to our space like Firefox and Chrome and Safari and Mac and others. But something also happened in 2007, actually to be more precise on June 29th, where Apple introduced the new smartphone, or today it's called the mobile device. But right after announced this new mobile and smartphone, we saw other vendors such as Samsung, LG, Sony, and many others uh, uh, providing and leveraging uh, their flavor of the mobile device by using the Android operating system. And that was actually the moment where the landscape of QA completely has changed because now we had the, the need not just to validate uh, the business processes on the desktop native applications and just one browser. Now we need to validate the different business processes, sometimes the same business processes on multiple endpoints. And uh, and what what we found ourselves with is that we need to have thousands of tests. That was the first reason. The second reason uh, of the need to have thousands of tests is also the life cycle. In this uh, decade, we saw the agile. We saw uh, the fact that we need to release faster. We need to release probably not like in 12 months, 18 months, uh, where we could get used to do, but more on a quarterly basis and sometime even uh, even more in a fast pace. In the last decade, it was uh, digital first. Uh, end users drives almost everything. If you will think about yourself for a second today with your consumption, whether if you're talking about the consumers or the business, the majority of the endpoints that you're working with, it's either your browser, whether if this is you know uh, uh, a Windows-based browser or a Mac uh, uh, browser, or you're using your mobile device, right? Either for uh, the business applications or for the consumer-based applications. And we also see in the last decade uh, the uh, increase, uh, uh, the increase amount of permutations, which are keep uh, uh, growing of the different mobile devices, vendors, operating system, browser solutions, native applications. Just to give you the rough idea, we are talking uh, on the native space of mobile applications today. It's, it's I think it's crossed the six billion all in all in the different marketplaces, and and our uh, uh, main challenge it's all about scale. We need to find a way to scale our testing. We need to find a way making sure we will be able to release in a fast pace uh, environment because now with uh, the agile and the DevOps, which is kind of agile on steroids, we need to release on a on a monthly basis, big weekly basis, sometimes on even on a daily basis. And sometimes when we say that we need to release something, it's not necessarily for production. It can be also uh, making sure that the daily check-ins of the developers won't introduce any regressions to the fundamental uh, capabilities of the product that we are testing. So we will be able to continue to do uh, the testing activities as usual. 
And what the future holds for us? Probably more things, more mobile devices, more permutations, more endpoints such as uh, wearables. Uh, we see that the wearable is becoming a very dominant space with their own application flavors. We see the different IoTs, millions and billions of, of endpoints that are going to interact with those different applications. And probably we cannot even forecast what it means or how many tests we need to execute in order uh, to release those different solutions to production. So the bottom line is that we need to work smarter. We definitely not need to work harder because the world has changed and so should automation. But you know what it means to work smarter? It means that we need to be smarter with the way we do testing. It means that we need to be smarter with the way we design the test automation. And it means that we need to be smarter with the way we maintain the automation assets. Uh, so, you know, we can leave the smarter as a buzzwords, or uh, we can drill down into this world smarter, understand what it means. So with the need to be smarter, we've been looking at some AI technologies and how those can be infused into our solutions to help you, to help our customers being smarter, as I'll show you later on in today's session. But before I'll show you how we leverage the AI to help you, let's start with how AI is disrupting the market as of today. So more than 80% of the businesses says that AI is actually a strategic priority for their businesses. And more than 75% of commercial enterprise applications will use AI by 2021 as indicated by IDC. And as a result of that, more than 30% of IT professionals worldwide are planning to invest in AI in the next 12 months or so. But you know, up until now, those are let's say mainly prediction, let's see what is already happening with our space. So we see that more than 20% of businesses have already incorporated AI into their processes, into their products, into their services as of today. And more than 60% of businesses says that the pressure to reduce costs will require them to use AI in that way or another. And the good news is that we see that more than 50% of executives that uh, AI solutions that already implemented within the organizations have helped them to increase the productivity and they show, they see a very strong signs of improvement in efficiency as well. But you know, up until now, I've been using the, the smart and the AI mainly as the buzzwords. Let's uh, let's uh, deep dive uh, for a few minutes about what is AI. So the first thing, uh, AI, it's an area of computer science uh, that it mainly aims to provide intelligence to the machines. And I'm pretty much sure that each and every one of you on the line here probably heard the, the, the terms uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning and deep learning and data science and all of those different terms. So let's, let's do some order in all of those uh, different names. So first of all, the artificial intelligence is the umbrella. And it's about how to enable machines to think like humans, as you are going to see later on in, in this session. And the machine learning, it's a subset of the artificial intelligence, and it's mainly aims around how we can train the machines to get better at a task without explicit programming. So, for example, we see many algorithms uh, that uh, their main goal is uh, uh, to be to improve the machines as they are exposed to more data over time. And the deep learning is a subset of machine learning, and it's how we it's for it's how we can use uh, multi-layered networks uh, that are coming from the machine learning space. So the bottom line is that we see that those different acronyms are connected together. And we also see the data science here. And the data science is extremely important piece of the machine learning and deep learning because it involves uh, the, uh, the principles of how we get our data, uh, how we understand what the problem that we want to solve, how we forming the hypothesis and running the test, making sure that once we are going to generate the AI engines and the AI models, those will uh, do what uh, they are expected to do. So let's talk about a bit about how we can build those AI engines. So first of all, the software of AI is trained to perform a simple task as well as complex one. And when we're talking about a simple task, we can create a very simple AI engine that will identify upon a given picture if it's a cat or a dog. 
And a complex task will be, for example, an AI engine that will be connected to a car and will provide it the ability to uh, be an autonomous car and to do all the different actions needed one while we are driving a car. Now, we are involved in the many researches around AI and what we saw is that AI applications uh, that are the most successful ones are the ones that based on pattern matching algorithms. So we are trying to find upon given data a pattern and once we identify the pattern, we try to find this pattern on a given data which the AI engine haven't seen before. So the way to do it is that the AI engine will consist of input data comparing it to the outputs and to the expected results. So just, I'll give you a simple example. Let's say that we wanna build an AI engine that will identify a dog. Then what I'll do, I'll feed this AI engine with the algorithm of the machine learning with few thousands of pictures of different dogs. I will tag it as a dog and I will let the machine learning algorithms to build its own uh, uh, logic of how to identify a dog. Usually it goes you know, with edges, with gray styling, with contrast, brightness, and so on and so forth. And once we build this AI engine, we can apply it on a program for example, a program that we will give it a picture, and if it's a dog, then the gate will open. If it's not a gate, and if it's not a dog, the gate will remain closed. So this was relatively a simple example, but eventually these applications that use the output of the AI training process, they uh, apply to solve a specific problems as I've mentioned previously. So for example, we can build an AI engine that is main purpose will be to analyze CT and MRI scans. What we cannot expect is that this AI engine that was built to analyze CT and MRI scans, it will be the one that will serve us in order to recognize a stop sign and slow down a car. And we will need to build an AI engine that this is main purpose. And if we'll take this AI engine of the car, we cannot expect it to be able to uh, serve as an automated responder and online customer support. We will need again to build a dedicated AI engine that will help us to do this task. So I gave like <clears throat> a few examples from different spaces, but you all guys came here today to hear about the test automation. So let's talk about our space. And if you remember when I talked about uh, how we uh, build or how we start an AI project, let's start with a problem first or why, with the challenge first. So what are the challenges in scaling automation? Uh, and, and why we do believe and why we do see that AI can help solve uh, those challenges that we are facing. So we have three main challenges that are constantly being uh, echoed by our customers and I'll, I'll walk you through those as well and I'm pretty much sure that a majority of you will agree with those challenges and will uh, agree that those are the challenges that you are facing on a daily basis in your organization as, all, as we saw also in the poll. So the first thing is difficulty keeping pace with change. And it's mainly because of the QA teams barely can keep up the pace of releases. You know, we talked about the weekly releases, the bi-weekly releases, sometimes the daily releases, and the frequent up changes that break the automations, the automation oftenly. And why the break the automation? Mainly because of assets resiliency. And uh, trust me, in the next slides, I'm going to walk you through an example conveying the message of why the automation assets today are fragile in the identification. And as a result of that, we see some issues with uh, their resiliency. The next thing, it's about too much time and effort. In today's reality where, you know, mobile and web, we talked about all, and it's all digital first, uh, they are the dominant technologies. Many times the QA teams duplicate and even triple the efforts of the test creation because think about a simple business process that you need to do something that you have uh, and you have the iOS and you have the Android and you have the mobile web and you need to create three different scripts. Now, it might be that you're gonna tell me, hey, you know, I can create one script and three object, different object depositories, but still Still, you need to maintain multiple scripts in the initial uh, uh, state or status of, of design the test. And upon change and when automation breaks, you need to maintain multiple scripts as well. And you find yourself many times uh, dealing with things and dealing with uh, tasks which are not uh, the ones that are matter to the overall project. And the last challenge, it's about tough to build and keep the right skills. 
you know, since automation became a mandatory part of the continuous testing, we still see that not all the QA teams has, you know, the right skills to deal with automation. And many times they, they find themselves being dependent on the automation engineers, which usually they are the minority of the team and they are becoming pretty much first the bottleneck in order to provide those automation assets. So having those three challenges, we found ourselves with the problem of scaling automation. And the bottom line is that we see that we have very low automation coverage rates, around about 20 to 30 percent. And unfortunately, this number is decreasing. And we see very uh, high maintenance costs. Uh, and unfortunately, this number is increasing. So if we see a low automation coverage rates and we see high maintenance costs, that definitely can give us the answer that we do have a challenge in scaling automation. And in order to convey the message, I'll walk you through a simple example in the next few slides to show you uh, some of the uh, points that I've just talked about. So let's talk about example of today reality. We need to automate a business process of buying an item in an e-commerce application, right? It's relatively very simple business process. You need to log in, provide username and password, you need to look for the item, you need to add it to the cart and uh, pay for it and log out, that's it. But you need also to automate it on iOS as well as on mobile web because you, as the provider of these e-commerce applications, wanna make sure that every endpoint such as Android, iOS, and even mobile web, when the users are trying to make a transactions, they will be able to do it with no problem. Otherwise, if they will find difficulties to buy an item in, for example, mobile web, then it's a direct business impact. So what are the challenges as a result of this simple uh, business process? First, we need to create three different scripts to automate the same flow. This is the first thing. The second thing, upon change, the automation sometimes, unfortunately, many times will break and you find yourself questioning the ROI of the overall automation. So I've created in advance a very simple example of just the login action. The login action, it means that I need to click on the profile, provide username and password, and click on the login button. So let's do it together, okay? So this is, uh, on the left side, you can see the UFT1, and on the right side, you can see the UFT Mobile, which will help me to get the devices and run the test. In that particular example, I'm going to use the Android-based device, and as you can see here, we are going to run the test now. Clicking on the menu. Profile, provide a username and a password and click on the, the sign in button, which means that everything is perfect. And this script is actually ready to be wrapped as a component that can be reused, which means it can also go to production now. And why is that? Because just think about all the business processes that are required as part of this e-commerce application. We need to use the login action again and again and again. And upon change, we will have a debate ROI because now we need to either change all the different areas where you, we are using this specific login action or we were smart enough in order to wrap it as a reusable component and just we need to change it once, but we still need to change it. So something happened last night and one of the developers decided that he's going to flip between the menu and the cart. Although a visual change that should not influence on the automation, but what happened is that the underlying identifier of the, of the menu was also changed, even without the developer awareness, as a result of this visual change. And unfortunately, the underlying identifier that was changed was also the one that I was relaying on in order to find the object, find uniquely the object and interact with it, right? Because this is the fundamental basics of automation. We need to uh, have an object repository that describe how we can uniquely identify the objects and how we can interact with those. So you can guess and you can imagine what will happen if I'll try to run this test now. And instead of clicking on the menu, I'll click on the cart because that was the change and username won't be found and password won't be found and definitely I won't be able to log in. And just imagine to yourself what will happen to the continuous testing environment on the daily check-ins or the nightly run. 
because when I'm going to come uh, to the work in the morning, I'll see that my test has failed. And if this, if this is the login action, which happens a lot uh, on the many business processes, then it means that I do not have any safe net, safety net for today in order to start my day uh, with the different UI activities. I'm pretty much sure that you guys uh, had the chance to see this uh, uh, in your in your uh, uh, different applications and solutions. Probably a much more, I would say, complex complex examples and and real life scenarios. But it's just to convey the message and show you how easy it is to uh, uh, break the test. So why did the test break? And the first thing is that object identification is based on the underlying identifiers as I've previously mentioned and we can see here the different identif the different objects and the different identifiers that I've been using in order to run the test. Now changes in the application implementation impact sometimes many times unfortunately again the underlying object and properties which end with automation breaks and this is mainly due to fragile identification. Now I know that many of you, including us, are spending tons of time how we can improve this fragile identification. And we came up with tons of great innovation in the last few years. But you know, with the reality of mobile and web and the need to keep, uh, uh, to keep running fast, even the innovation that we came up with and even all the solutions that you uh, try to bring into the table, we've still found ourselves with one of these uh, key challenges about the fragile identification that leads to uh, the automation breaks and all the challenges that I've previously described. So that was the minute around about two years ago when we started to think about what if we could automate a test as a human does. And just think about yourself for a second. If you are going to run this test of buying an item in an e-commerce application, right? You don't need three different scripts in order to run it on iOS, Android, and mobile web. And if uh, the, there will be a flip between the menu and the cart, you will still be able to execute a business process with no problem. You might gonna say that there is a UX change and you want to validate it, but you are still going to be able to do this task. And why is that? Because when you're looking at the screen, you don't care about the underlying identifiers. You have the click profile button. You have, you can see the the, uh, the search input field where you can place the, the right value that you can place it. You can see the button of search and you can see other different icons such as the cart, for example. So that was the thinking process for us. And what we did in, in MicroFocus uh, was uh, looking at some AI areas, mainly uh, the perception, which the perception is how we can mimic the human senses. One of the human senses is the ability to see things. And also we leverage uh, the machine and deep learning by using supervised learning techniques. So once we see something, we know exactly what needs to be done with it. So for example, if you see a button, then you know that you can click on it. If you see an input field, then you know that you can provide an input field to it. So what we have done, and we built into UFT1 the eyes and the brain. The eyes are the ones that will help UFT to identify the object the same way as human does. And we also build the brain that upon seeing something, we can know we can now interact and manipulate with the different objects that we see on the screen using uh, neural networks that was built into the UFT one. So I'm going to show you now how I'm going to execute this simple business process uh, of buying an item in an e-commerce shop using the new capabilities that are embedded into the UFT because as I previously started the session with is that we infuse the AI capabilities because we want you guys to be able to use the same tool with advanced capabilities and with advanced AI technology. So before running the test again, you can see here on the right side uh, the uh, mobile device coming from the UFT mobile. On the left side, you can see the UFT one with the new SDK. The new SDK name is AI Util. And when I'm specifying this uh, syntax, it means that I'm going to ask the UFT to activate the AI service. No worries, it's not a cloud service. It's not a server service. This service is embedded into your UFT. And you can see here that I'm going to uh, click on the menu and I'm going to click on the profile and I'm going to provide the username and password and, and of course uh, add the item and so on and so forth. Trust me, if you're going to open this test, there is no object repository because we don't care about object repositories anymore, exactly like human beings. 
And you are going to see that the same test that I designed for one time, it's going to be executed on Android as well as on iOS. So you can start get a feeling of what it means to you. It means that you don't need to deal with object repositories anymore. It means that you are going to design a single test for multiple uh, endpoints and multiple uh, uh, permutations. And you will be able to uh, uh, start thinking again like the user. One of our customers that already using this, he told us that using the AI, he started to think again how user is going to consume the solution and try to mimic it in the automation, uh, in the automation tasks. So I'm going to run this test now. As you're going to see, we are going to use the Android and the iOS at the environment to be executed. And let's run this test. So first of all, I'm going to set a context to the device. I'm going to launch the application. I'm going to click on the hamburger menu, click on the login button, provide a username and a password, and click on the login. By the way, just look at the login because on the iOS, it's going to be probably sign in, and we have our ways to understand the heuristics and also interact with it. So now upon completion of uh, this test, we are going to switch to the iOS and we are going to use the same test. It's not a different test. There is no object repository because same goes for you. As a human being, you will be able to grab an Android device, an iOS device and run the same test against uh, different endpoints. And as you can see here, we see the login. As we saw earlier, it was the sign in. We still understand it using the AI capabilities inside. So this SDK is uh, a brand new SDK that we have added to UFT in the last, I would say, 12 months. And we also made sure that it will be part of our rich report capabilities. As you can see here, we have the, you have the screenshot came in, coming from the device. You have the different actions into the uh, low level of what the actions that we were executed. And we can also have a high level report that shows us uh, the successful the success of the test so that was the first part but as you will remember i told you that we have three key challenges and one of the challenges it's about the users uh, that probably are not equipped you know with the coding and scripting knowledge and they still want to be able to be part i would say from the automation party so if you remember i showed you that we have leveraged computer vision and neural networks but we did one more thing we have introduced the translator. This is uh, the homegrown name that we gave it. And we did it by using an NLP capabilities that are also uh, embedded into the UFT1. And now we have also introduced a very simple language, almost plain English, yet structured, that, that almost everyone can write tests now. And once you're going to see this test, you might be confused because it looks like a manual test but not, it, no, it's not a manual test, it's an automated test. And the way to do it is that the translator will take those NLP commands and we translate it into a very simple language that UFT1 can understand and execute the test upon it. And of course, the translator will use the same capabilities as I showed you with UFT1, which are the eyes and the brain. So the next demo, what I'm going to show you, and I'm very thrilled to share this demo with you, is the brand new Codeless Designer. And what we see here on the screen is the following. First of all, on the left side, you can see the new uh, editor, the new designer. On the sidebar, you can see all the different activities that we can do in order to create a test. And on the right side, you can see the mobile device again coming from UFT Mobile. Of course, our AI capabilities are not only for mobile testing, they are also for desktop browsers. And in a very uh, foreseen future, we are also going to support some native desktop solutions as well. So in this demo, what I'm going to uh, walk you through, we are going to design the test together. And upon completion of the design of the test, we are going to execute the test. Again, the same test is going to be executed against uh, uh, the three different environments, the iOS, the Android, and the mobile web. So let's see how it goes. So first we'll grab a device. It's going to be iPhone in that case. We are also going to grab an application. This is the e-commerce application. And we are going now to launch the device. 
because we need a device in order to interact with. Now we are going to click on the inspect. The inspect button, it's think about it like the eyes. Now we want this designer to see the screen here and understand what the different objects that we have, such as the menu, the card, the search input field, the search button, and so on and so forth. So we are going to click on the inspect. You can see here the snapshot and all the pink rectangles are the ones that I can interact with. So I'll start by double click on this one and we are creating the first NLP command, click the hamburger menu. Now we are going to add also in a very easy way, click the profile, write it in a very native and simple way. And we are going also to provide a username and a password. We talked about the brain. So the brain understands that this is an input field and we need to provide a value. Of course, the val these, those values can be also connected to external data resources and to iterations later on. And now we can also edit a step by choosing a class. A class means that I want to click on a button now. The name of the button is going to be login and I'm going to click on it. One more important thing that I'd like to just stop for a second the demo here. You can see here the position. The position is uh, something that we have added and they, again, it's coming from the thinking process about human beings because as you can see here on the right side, you have the login on the upper area of the screen and you have the login on uh, the more of the lower area of the screen, right? So if I'll ask you to click on the login, majority of you will click on this. It might be that some of the uh, uh, people will uh, ask me the question, which login you want me to click on, the second or the first? And then we added the position and the position can be also relative to other objects on the screen. And the position can be, please click on the login, the second one from the top, or please click on the login, the first one from the bottom. So we can also add a position. And now what we are going to do is to continue to create the test. We're going to click on the menu. We are going to now add the 70 T. This is the this is the default the value that I want to interact with and just to see how simple it is. Click or search for 70T. Our NLP engine will understand that we need to look for a search input, provide the 70T and click on the login button. By the way, what we also see here that not just the visual elements, but you can also switch to our very advanced OCR capabilities if you want to identify different screens. And we are going now to click on the add to cart. Now, one of the things uh, I want to show you here, you can see the details were not identified by the AI engine. No problem with that. You can uh, switch back to the traditional way of identifying an object to the spy, click the product details and apply it. This specific item will be added as a property based. And now what you can do is also share feedback with us. So you're going to click on the help us to improve that will open uh, this solution that is embedded into the solution itself, you will mark the object uh, that is not identified for you in the AI way. And once you are going to submit this feedback to Microfocus, it will arrive in seconds to our premises, into our automated AI engines that will analyze it. And once a fix will be ready, either add an additional object or fix the existing one, you will be able to consume the AI engine directly uh, from the tool itself. So I'll open a test that I've created in advance and I'm going to choose the environments. In that case, as I'll tell you, I'm going to run Samsung, Android and mobile web. And I'm going to run the test. So just summarize before the test is initializing and running, you can see here a very simple, almost native English, yet structured. Uh, the same script is going to be executed against Samsung or Android, to be more precise, against uh, iOS and also against mobile web. And you can see here that even uh, when with the, this uh, device, you have different elements, you have different resolutions, you have different naming, for example, for the login and sign in. When you are going, when we are going to execute it on the mobile web, as you can see it, as you can see it in a second, you can see that even the UI is completely different. So when you click on the menu, you have a sidebar. We still capable easily to run this test the same way as human does. And once we complete running the test, we are going to open the report, the same report that we have in the UFT one, a very rich report that show you all the different elements that you have on the screen. 
of course, uh, you can drill down to the specific object if you want to investigate something, if you want to update the script. And just to let you know that once, if script will be broken because of uh, a developer has changed something, probably this the, the assets themselves will be much more resilient assets. But if still you need to maintain something, you need to maintain a single script and not three different script. So this for you means a complete new space where you're not going to waste your time on things that are really not matters. Okay, so now I'm going to show you something that we have released a few weeks back. As I told you, we have released both the mobile as well as uh, the desktop browsers. And we are going to use UFT1 just to create the login action. But the good news is that you're going to use the same script as you're going to see here on Chrome, on Firefox, and on the uh, mobile device on the native application. So let's do this design together and execute the test pretty much fast. So the first thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to launch uh, the browser because it's much more easy for me to create uh, uh, the test on a browser. The first command will be looking for the menu and click on it if it exists. If it's not exist, we can skip on that particular step because on the mobile we have the menu and on the browser we do not have the menu. And now the next thing will be to do the spy. By the way, the spy, you can see here that you have the AI auto, in, auto inspection at the bottom of the page and we can drag and drop and you can see the AI util in action. So the AI util profile click. Now what we are going to do is to also open the browser. We are going to take the snapshot of the browser using our AI capabilities. And you can see here that I have the same image with all the different elements that are identified and I can drag and drop. In that case, I need the username and the password. And of course, clicking on the sign in button. Of course, I have all the different elements if I want to uh, enrich the test. And same like I showed you in the mobile, we have also the ability to switch between the visual elements as well as the OCR capabilities, as you can see here on the screen. So now what we are going to do is to beautify a bit the script, add some uh, default values, and we are going to execute the test. So the username, the password, and let's run it. Again, trust me, if you're going to look for object repository, you're not going to find any object repository because we don't care about those anymore. So now we are running on Firefox, providing the username, the password. You can see the sign in. And once we accomplish this task, we will move to the mobile device and we are going to do the login action again, very easily using the same script on both web and mobile. Once we complete the execution of the test, the same report as I shared with you earlier today will be available uh, to do the exploration of the test results. Okay, so I'd like to summarize the session of today by uh, walking through the key benefits of leveraging AI in test automation and how this technology that infused you, uh, uh, the UFT family, can help you solve many of the challenges, if not all the challenges that you guys are facing on a daily basis. First, you're going to reduce your maintenance cost at least by 70%. And why is that? Because you don't need to design three different scripts for the same purpose. You don't need to maintain upon every change and around about 60 to 70 percent this is the calculation that can that you can do easily yourself because one script and not three different scripts by definition is 66 percent of saving and also the resiliency that is increased now then at least 70 percent you are going to increase the automation coverage at least by 30 percent and why is that because the developer of the test will be in a three times faster than uh, what you guys used to do in the past. And why is that? Again, you need to design a single test. As you saw, the interaction with both the codeless as well as the AI SDK, it's a much more simple way to interact with it. And last but not least, everyone can write tests. So the automation part is now open for everyone and not just for the automation engineers. So with that, I was really enjoyed providing this part of the session and uh, let's open the session for question and I'll hand over it back to you, Charlene. Thank you. 
Okay, great, great. So we are about 16 minutes to the top of the hour. We have plenty of time for question and answer period. So if you do have a question for Aaron, please go ahead and use your uh, GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And let's go ahead and dive into the questions we have already. Um, let's see, uh, what is the logic implemented to capture the DOE? Don't. Sorry, can you repeat? You were a bit cut. What is the logic? Oh, sure. What is the logic implemented to capture the it's DOM, D-O-M? Okay, so there is no DOM involved in, in this uh, technology. The, the DOM is not an interest of the AI. And again, think about like a human being. Human being doesn't understand what is DOM. The elements are being on the screen. The elements that are available on the screen are the only elements that user can interact with. And this is exactly what we, uh, we, we have done here. So we are seeing all the elements as are uh, being showed on the device itself. And once we understand what those elements are using the AI capabilities, we provide the ability to interact with them using uh, the brain, as I previously showed you. All right, great. Next question. Um, when will we have the AI interacting with other languages like Portuguese? Okay, so I guess the, the question is referred to the NLP. Uh, mm -hmm. area and the NLP for now is available only for English. One of the things that we are working on nowadays for the next release is also to give a more freedom of choice what a different OCR capabilities that the customers can work with and, and, and providing additional languages that will be part of our uh, NLP and OCR capabilities. So okay. uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll split the question, I'll split the answer into two. If we're talking about the NLP, I would say that Portuguese and other languages, uh, probably it will be in later time. If we're talking about the OCR, it's definitely in the foreseen future. All right, excellent. All right, guys, plenty of time for questions. So go ahead and get your question in. Next one here, how are tests handled that require di different treatment for some devices? So uh, the, the, the treatment about different devices, if we're talking about, you know, swipe and gestures and things like that, again, the same way we have uh, in our UFT mobile solutions, those are the things that can be done today with the different simulations. If there are different frameworks on the mobile device that are being used in order to show the different elements, those are, again, less relevant for us. And the idea is that when you have a menu, I don't care if it's being implemented in Dart, in Flutter, or in any other technology, as long as as a human being, I can identify it as a menu, where usually it's going to be in a mobile device like a three lines, uh, and then our AI, engine, our AI engine will be able to do the same. Excellent, okay. All right, great, next question here. So many good ones here. Are there plans to expand this type of functionality to other microfocus tools like Silk Test? Yes. So the, the idea is that the AI engines uh, that I've walked you through today, those are services which are not coupled to this solution or another. And uh, the idea was that we are going to expand it to our so other solutions within our portfolio. So now we have it for the UFT1. We definitely look at how we can expand it to having also these AI capabilities into the UFT developer and also to the Silk family, which is part of uh, the overall microfocus functional testing. And uh, this is definitely something we are working with uh, the other product managers within the team and how they, they can consume easily the AI capabilities. All right, great. Next question here. Uh, what techniques of AI are used? Are neural networks, vision algorithms, uh, what else? So the techniques that are being used in our AI engines, we have few of those. Uh, you, we are using mainly the computer vision and we have built a CNN, a convolutional neural networks that help us to do the better task of understand what we see on the screen. And we have been using other elements, uh, which are kind of uh, areas within the algorithms of the ANNs that help us to determine what exactly can be done with the specific element that we saw on the screen. 
As for the OCR uh, capabilities, we have been using our uh, internal OCR, which is part of the IDLE family. And this is a very advanced uh, OCR engine that won uh, one of the greatest awards just a few days back specifically on the space of the AI. And we do use some other stuff that help us to fulfill this task. All right, great. Let's see. We are 10 minutes to the top of the hour. So I think we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, here's a good one. Are there, uh, are there certain um, areas where we cannot apply AI in automation testing? Okay, I, I would I would say that AI, and this is something I didn't mention up until now. I would say that AI it's a journey. It's a journey for our customers. It's definitely a journey for us. But a good thing is that AI it's a great technology that is uh, it is involving every day. Uh, we are talking about AI. You know, there there are the AI space is a super hot topic. The best uh, minds are uh, dealing with uh, this uh, technology, and every day we see a new capabilities that are being introduced. I would say that you know the AI probably or. Oh, I don't see how AI can replace the human beings in the testing actions. It definitely can be a great assistant and can help us to save tons of time. If we're talking about the, if we're talking about AI in the space of testing, then definitely I see an area of the AI analytics that can be also can be also invested in, the, uh, for example, how we can improve the test design in terms of what the exact test that needs to be executed upon specific usage that can be analyzed from production and upon different uh, uh, check-ins that are being derived by development and what are the tests that we want to execute using different analytics and statistics. So I do believe that the AI can help us expand many areas that we are dealing with today and spend tons of time, mainly around the data-driven decisions, but it's still going to be an assistant. It's not going to, uh, I would say, replace uh, the need for uh, the queue engineers and the testing profession. The same way, by the way, that even the most advanced autonomous uh, driving capabilities are not replacing the need of having the driver sitting in the driving seat. I need to make sure that when the AI is taking decisions, those decisions are the right one and not the ones that will do a severe mistake. All right, great. Uh, next question here. Um... Let's see. Is there any way to maintain test data using the help of AI? And if, if yes, how? So that that is a great question. Test data. I think test data uh, as a separate topic. This is uh, one of uh, one of the key challenges that uh, QA are facing for the last few years. And I definitely see an area of how we can apply AI into uh, the test data space. And I'm not talking about how we can import the test data to uh, the different solutions. And I'm not talking about how we can extract it from production and things like that. But definitely we do have, by the way, as of today, some algorithms that help us to have the same test with uh, multiple data sets according to different algorithms such as pairwise and triplet. And we do have those capabilities already within the product. But I think if we can associate uh, these, uh, those capabilities with what is being executed in production and understand how the test data can be much more efficient because it's not it's not uh, just the task of uh, running a, a, an infinite amount of tests with uh, with different data sets. It's also to be able to run the tests that are really matter to uh, the production and what is being used in production. So the test data, it's an area of more of AI analytics, less of a computer vision and OCR and other stuff. But uh, I definitely see a place where AI analytics can help in the test data area as well. All right, great. Um, next question. I understand that the point in AI from Microfocus is teach new elements and objects to the algorithm when the user suggests a Microfocus from a form. Why couldn't we teach the algorithm by ourselves and send it online automatically like a batch event? Yeah, that that is uh, I think the ultimate question when I'm getting when I'm when we present this stuff. The thing is that the uh, the training process, as I've previously shared with you, the training process required require a very uh, I would say extensive computing power, uh, both on the storage and with the big data solutions, as well as uh, as well as computing power in the areas graphics, like there's very advanced GPU capabilities that we have built and created. 
this is one thing which we are almost sure that our customers uh, we don't want them to deal with that this is one thing the second thing is that when we apply a new um, a new classes or a new elements or even uh, improving an existing elements it's not just about adding those elements it's about making sure that we do not have any regression with uh, the accuracy rate we have for the other, other elements already and we will not create any degradation with what already customers get used to work with uh, uh, making sure that they will be able to continue with no problem what we do uh, going to uh, provide to our customers is the ability to have a federated model so once they have a federated model they can have uh, uh, the generic model in one place and they can have a federated model which can be addressed for specific needs for example either a custom application that they want to build uh, the uh, the different elements or use the existing ones or using for example the ERP take, take for example SAP and, and the S4HANA and all of those kind of different technologies then what we are seeing is the ability to have a generic model a custom model or a federated one and uh, in the future we are going also to offer a cloud service where customers can say this is the element i want to you to train and and it might be that we will be able to provide this the last thing on that point is that even you if you provide a one image that is not working for you or a one screenshot and and telling us that this element is not identified for ai engines we need a vast amount of data in order to train the ai to be able to do this task and we have our own uh, our knowledge and capabilities how we can augment uh, the uh, the specific elements that are not working for you because if we will just train the engine with one element probably it will not change the weights within the neural networks that will do the task to fix the problem uh, the customer is facing all right great well we're about four minutes to the top of the hour so unfortunately that's all the time that we have for a question and answer period i do want to thank everybody who did submit questions and i know we had a ton of them if we didn't get to your question i apologize but please know that aaron is going to get a copy of all of the questions that came in and i'm sure that he or somebody from his organization will be more than happy to follow up with you offline to get your question answered so um yeah, so that, that, that will be happening post-event. Also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. Uh, following today's webinar, we are sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Okay, at the top of the hour, I did note that we would be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get that done. Our first winner today is Ali H. Congratulations, Ali. Our second winner today is Angela A. Congratulations, Angela. Our third winner today is Evan H. Congratulations, Evan. And our final winner today is Nadia I. Congratulations, Nadia. Uh, and congratulations to all four of you. Uh, please check your email. We'll be sending out the uh, the e the gift card by email so please check your inbox uh, if it's not there check your spam folder for sure so uh, Aaron thank you very much for a great presentation lots of really really fascinating stuff in there and judging from the number and the quality of the questions we got um, you know the audience got a lot out of it too so thanks again for your time for your expertise really really good stuff thank you thank you very much for hosting us no it's my pleasure I also want to thank the audience for joining me today this is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Please stay safe.